Welcome back to episode four, part two of Build Cisco SD Access Fabric LAN Automation Demonstration. If you want to re-familiarize yourself with the theory or setup for this demonstration, please review episode four, part one. All right, let's get into it. Here we are on the Catalyst Center landing page. And the first thing we want to do is discover the two switches to which I've already applied the preliminary configurations that were shown in the slides a moment ago. So we go hamburger menu, tools, discovery, and then we'll start a new discovery job. Give it a name and then enter an IP range for the discovery job to run against. As you may have observed in the preliminary configurations earlier, switch one was dot 36 and switch two was dot 37. Then we choose to use the loopback address as the management address if possible. In the case of SD access, the loopback address is crucial to many functions and we should use it as the management address. So we'll turn that on. Next, we need to choose what credentials Catalyst Center will use to discover these two devices. Here we have a username, netadmin1, that we defined in an earlier episode relating to the design menu. We also have SNMP communities that we defined in that earlier video, and we'll turn on netconf. If you wanna know where the CLI or SNMP credentials came from, please go back and watch the earlier episode relating to design menu. After we click next, we have some scheduling choices to make. We'll just use the defaults and click next again. Then there's a summary screen explaining what's about to happen. Uh, as we can see, we've got our IP address range, our credentials and so on. And we'll just go ahead and start the discovery. We can click to view the discovery job once it's commenced. To begin with, there'll be nothing on screen. Catalyst Center is going out and probing those IP addresses in the range and attempting to log into devices it finds using the credentials we've selected. So if we fast forward, here we'll see that two devices have indeed been discovered, the EBCP1 and 2, and we can see that the SNMP, CLI, and NetConf were all successful. Now we can go to Hamburger Menu, Provision, Inventory, and here we see the two devices that have been discovered listed in inventory. You may also see something like NA here briefly. That just means that all the settings haven't been read in yet. So if you see NA or some incomplete information, just wait a moment and refresh the screen until you've got all the device details listed here. Now in this case, these two switches, as we saw in the topology earlier, will be distribution switches. So we'll change their device role to distribution. And then we can go ahead and select the switches and go to action, provision, provision device. When we provision devices in Catalyst Center, we're telling Catalyst Center to deploy the settings we defined in the design menu. Now in this case, we covered the design menu in the previous episode. So if you're unclear what these settings are or what the network hierarchy is, please go back and watch the earlier episode where we explained and configured these variables. Next, we'll choose a location for each switch. The location represents obviously the physical location where the switch is installed. So in this case, switch one will go to MEL building one level one. And switch two will go to MEL building two level one. We click next. And here we see any advanced configuration. There is none, so we can just continue by clicking next again. And now we have a summary of what is going to be provisioned to each switch. So we can see our radius servers, which are PSNs in the ICE cluster. We can see our NTP servers. And again, we defined all of these settings in earlier episodes. So you could go back and watch those earlier episodes to see where these settings came from. We're happy, so we'll click next and then apply. We're then taken to pre-checks, which is here to make sure the configuration we plan to deploy is going to be successful. Those pre-checks pass, so again, we click next. 
Then we're taken to a screen where we're given a preview of the configuration diffs that will be applied to each switch. We can turn off configuration preview. Here though, we're just using the default settings of having configuration preview enabled. As we can see here, there is on the left configuration to be deployed and on the right running configuration. For the sake of an interesting video, we're not going to go through the config diffs, but they're there if you want to review them in your network. We're happy with this, so we'll click deploy. And now these configurations will be provisioned to those two switches, switch one and switch two. Now that the switches are provisioned, they can be used in LAN automation as seed switches. Seed switches means that they will become a launching pad for Catalyst Center to discover factory default switches that are directly or indirectly attached to the seeds. So we go to hamburger menu, provision, LAN automation. Here in the overview tab of LAN automation, there is a brief rundown of the steps required to accomplish LAN automation. We have done all of these things bar the final step in this video and earlier episodes. So we will go ahead and start LAN automation now. There's a brief summary of what LAN automation is. We'll skip past that. You can always pause the video and read it if you want to. Next, we need to choose our seed switches. Our primary seed will be switch one that we've just discovered and provisioned. As you may remember, switch one is provisioned under a building in the MEL site. So we'll select MEL and then choose switch one. There is a discovery depth choice here. This defines how many hops LAN automation will search from the seed switch. So if we chose one, it would only discover factory default switches directly connected to the seed. If we leave it as two, then LAN automation will discover factory default switches directly connected to the seed or one hop away from the seed. Next, we choose select interfaces and the interfaces we choose here will be the interfaces through which LAN automation will discover factory default switches. Now we can see here that interfaces 5, 6, 25 and 26 all have a CDP neighbor host name of switch. This is a big clue that those switches are factory default switches. And of course, I know I connected factory default switches to those four interfaces. The interfaces don't have to be up when LAN automation is started. They might be down and there's a plan later to connect factory default switches. It just happens that in this case, I've already connected my factory default switches. So either or, start and then connect switches or connect switches then start, whichever order of operation suits you is fine. We click save and now we'll go and choose our secondary seed, meaning LAN automation will be configuring routed links between the secondary seed and the factory default switches that are discovered. The secondary seed is also located under the MEL site. And in this case, we'll choose switch two, which we discovered and provisioned just a moment ago. We click next. And now we're given here an opportunity to enter the settings relevant to the LAN automation session that's about to run. So the first thing we want to do is decide where new factory default switches, otherwise known as discovered devices, will be placed in the network hierarchy. So for now, we'll just put them in MEL building one, level one. We can change where these switches are located later, but here we'll choose level one as a placeholder. Next, we choose a principal address pool. This is an IP range that is used to discover and provision our factory default switches. This range, LAN Auto MEL, we defined in an earlier episode. So if you want to know where that came from, go back and watch that earlier episode, please. Next, we'll enter an ISIS domain password. This is the same password that I used in the preliminary configurations earlier, and it will be used to authenticate ISIS peerings on the LAN automated switches. Next, we'll enable multicast. That means LAN automation will establish ASM and SSM multicast routing in the global routing table on the LAN automated switches. And that multicast routing is important 
because SD access overlays, which we'll provision in future episodes, may use global routing table multicast in order to accomplish layer two flooding or multicast replication in SD access overlays. So in short, you should almost always enable multicast. You may choose not to enable multicast if you have your own bespoke multicast configuration that you need to be deployed to these switches, in which case you would complete LAN automation and then you would go and configure multicast after LAN automation has concluded. Here we'll go with what is the most common scenario and enable multicast. We'll also go ahead and advertise LAN automation IP ranges into BGP. In other words, we'll advertise the principal IP address pool into BGP. As we saw earlier, the primary and secondary seed switches are peering BGP with the external network. And when we advertise the LAN automation routes into BGP, that makes the discovered devices, the factory default switches, reachable to Catalyst Center so they can be configured by Catalyst Center. If you did not check this box, then you would need to inject the IP range for LAN automation into your routing protocol through a template or on the CLI. There's some other settings here. We won't worry about those for this video. We click review and we get, after we close this password prompt, a summary of the settings that we've just input into the LAN automation start workflow. We're happy with these, so we'll go ahead and start LAN automation. What we see is the LAN automation session moves to the top of the screen. We could start another session if we wished. So perhaps if we have another site where we're also onboarding switches, we may start a separate session. In this case, we're just doing a single site. So let's go into see the session details. As we can see at the top of the screen, the status of LAN automation is initialized and we have two seed devices. Currently we have no discovered or provisioned devices and that's because LAN automation is just starting. If we click on discovered, what we'll get here in a moment is a list of all the factory default switches that are connected to those primary seed interfaces up to two hops away from the primary seed as per the settings we chose in the start workflow. So we'll use a little bit of video editing magic here to skip past the waiting period, which might be a few minutes, to see that we have six discovered factory default switches in varying states of discovery as shown in the status column on the right hand side. We also see here the platforms and the serial numbers. And once these switches are fully discovered and LAN automation has deployed a base configuration to those switches, they will move into the provisioned state. So again, if we use some fast forward video editing magic, we'll see here now we have no discovered switches and we have six provision switches and the status is fully provisioned on all six. Given that I don't intend to onboard any more factory default switches right now, I'll go ahead and stop LAN automation. Before LAN automation stops, we're given an opportunity to review host names and IP addresses that will be finalized to these previously factory default switches. Now I happen to know that these serial numbers and platforms from the top down relate to certain functions I expect them to perform later in my network. So I'll go ahead and rename them now. MEL IN1 and 2 will be SD access intermediate nodes, which means they don't actually have an SD access role. They're just doing routing and link aggregation. The other four switches will be MEL EN number, meaning each of these will be provisioned as SD access edge nodes. And we'll worry about that in a future video. We also have an opportunity to change the loopback zero IP address of each LAN automated switch. In this case, the defaults are fine, so we'll proceed with those. Next, I click validate. That's telling LAN automation to confirm that the device host names and the loopback zero IP addresses as shown on screen are accurate 
and don't break any rules with respect to IP address overlapping or invalid host name formats. And as we can see, everything's fine. So we'll click apply to proceed with the stop function. We can see now that the LAN automation status has gone to stop in progress. That means our custom host names and loopback addresses are being deployed to the LAN automated switches. And all of the links between these LAN automated switches are being converted to point to point routed links running ISIS. And we want point to point routed links, of course, because it eliminates layer two. So trunk ports and access VLANs and spanning trees, which can lead to stability problems later. I'm sure plenty of people have seen a spanning tree configuration mistake or a switching loop. Well, that's not possible in a routed access network. There is no layer two, so there can't be any layer two stability issues. If we fast forward again, we'll see now that LAN automation concludes. We get this success pop-up, and that means all of those previously factory default switches are now part of an end-to-end, point-to-point ISIS routed access network, and that our ASM and SSM multicast routing has been established. We can go to hamburger menu, tools, topology, and here we can see if we go to the MEL location that we have our two seed switches, EBCP1 and 2, and then we have all of these other switches that were previously factory default as zero touch onboarded into the Catalyst Center topology and the Catalyst Center inventory. We go now to hamburger menu, provision, inventory, and our final step here is to tell Catalyst Center to take control of the configuration on these switches and to deploy our settings from the design menu. Again, we covered design menu in an earlier video. We select all of our LAN automated switches and go to actions, provision, provision device. Next, we're asked to confirm the location of each switch. So I could change these to different buildings or floors but for the sake of keeping the video on point, I'll just leave them as building one, level one, and click next. We're shown here advanced configuration, which would list any templates that might apply to these devices. We haven't defined templates, so this screen is blank, and we'll click next to proceed. Finally, before we commence provisioning, on the left, we're given each switch name that is going to be provisioned, and on the right, we have the network settings that will be provisioned to those switches. We're happy with this, so we'll click next. And then we're given a list of pre-checks to make sure the configuration that is about to be applied will apply correctly. All of the pre-checks pass, so again, we click next. Next, we're given a screen where Catalyst Center calculates the configuration differences for each switch that is about to be provisioned. Once the diffs are complete, we see on the left configuration to be deployed and on the right running configuration. The configuration to be deployed is derived from the settings we put into the design menu. Again, we explained and configured design menu in an earlier episode. I'm not going to review these configuration diffs. I know they're correct, so I'll go ahead and deploy. And the final step here, just one more thing I wanted to show you. If we log into the ICE interface, and go to Hamburger Menu, Administration, Network Devices. Here we see a list of devices that ICE will allow to participate in RADIUS and TrustSec. And these devices, the MEL DASH devices, all of the switches we've just discovered and onboarded, have been added as ICE network devices by the Catalyst Center Automation. In other words, these network devices have been configured to transact with ICE, and ICE has been configured to allow those transactions. Obviously, this represents a time saving for you as a network operator, because you don't need to establish these relationships between network devices and ICE manually. All right, that's it for LAN automation. In the next episode, we'll get into SD access role provisioning. 
Thanks for your time watching. I hope it's been helpful. See you on the next one.